Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, in a way, I'm covering ground that's similar to Kevin's, but my perspective is, is uh, qualitative. It also takes a longer historical view for two reasons. One, because I always take a historical view. And two, I've been engaged in that history. I was working for an international oil company in Beijing in the early 90s when the Chinese oil companies first started going out. And even 10 years earlier, I arrived in, in Zambia soon after the opening of the Tanzania-Zambia Railway, which was one of uh, China's earlier forays into Africa that was largely wasted. But uh, let us not dwell on that one. So I will share my screen. Sorry, something stupid happened. There we go. Okay. So I struggled finding a title suitable to the conference. How and why have patterns of China's outbound energy investment and other activities changed? That's easy. Uh, since it's a BRI conference, I felt I had to put BRI. If I had been more ruthless, I would have had despite BRI rather than under or because of BRI. But this is contentious and I'm prepared to see pushback on that. And I suppose the first slide, the first two slides will summarize my argument. And it is qualitative. I don't have the, the resources that Kevin has. Um, so I observe and steal other people's work like Kevin's and, and whatever and, and use it in a very general way. So this is a hugely simplified diagram that shows for different types of activity in very general ways how things have grown or not over the last 30 years. But actually, it goes back further. So fossil fuel imports, particularly oil and coal, go back to the 1980s. Yeah, uh, this has been going on for yeah, 50 years. Um, and so I'm looking at all activities outside, uh, but it all links together. In 1993, China became a net importer of oil. Um, and then obviously that's grown and gas in 2006 and coal has come and gone depending on domestic needs. Fossil fuel investment, again, goes back really to the early 1990s. It grows not only direct investment in oil and gas uh, deposits and some coal, but providing services, oil field services as well. And that grew. And in fact, as we will see in more detail in a minute, it crashed in 2013 14, just as BRI was announced. And then has picked up um, moderately since, but in a much more careful way. Hydro dam construction, uh, usually EPC contracts, not investment, goes back to the 1960s. So that's been going on for nearly 60 years. This is not new, though it has been growing, as Kevin has identified in recent years. Thermal power plants and power grids, both direct investment and EPC contracts, they've been growing, but really since the 2000s not directly related to BRI. Nuclear energy is starting to step overseas in a small way, but that just reflects the development of the domestic nuclear industry. Wind and solar, as Kevin said, not so much direct investment, but certainly exports of equipment, that goes back to the 2000s, not related to BRI. At the bottom, we have the technology minerals, these are the minerals related to electricity. I'll come to the details later. Modern electricity technologies, and these have been growing during the 2000s. And of course, what is the big change? And sort of Kevin indicated that indirectly, but if we have a historical view, is this switch of balance from what was almost totally fossil fuels to something that is now fossil fuels and electricity. So the portfolio has grown. And I've indicated the start of the go out policy uh, in 2000 or so at the bottom and BRI. And you know, it'd be very interesting to take Kevin's data back to 1990 and really analyze 
what and where did BRI make a real difference compared to the go out policy you had adding in the the fossil fuel sector but that's for another day and my second slide looks at something that Kevin looked at um, but again across these fields looking at the corporate motivations for the internationalization uh, under these these different headings and in general uh, and I think Erica Downs who, who I, I'm going to say cooperate with we talk to each other a lot would agree that much of this is driven by the companies and um, they want to build markets for investment for foreign direct investment or for products and services overseas why because the opportunities at home are getting smaller in oil and gas that was occurring in the 1990s because i was an oil and gas geologist the reserves are limited um hydro dams again that's slowing down power grids thermal power plants you know nuclear wind all these companies can see the future or did see the future to say look we want to be big we have to get out of the country we can't stay here now contrary to what Gavin says i believe that the access to the resource is not of core importance to the companies uh, because much of this oil actually is sold onto international markets um, and and having oil in angola and ecuador does not help uh, security supply if there is a major crisis. The one exception in my view is the technology minerals uh, which the companies definitely want to bring back to China. There are also on the right hand side strategic assets from the point of view of technology and skills and that is particularly prominent in the, the renewable energy sector where they wanted to, to get ahead, get up to the frontier technology and therefore they buy companies that help them there. The same in fossil fuels and nuclear energy. Uh, why is the Chinese working with EDF in, in, in Britain on the nuclear plant? So very simplified, I mean, that is my simplified thesis. And I'm now going to just pick on, go through each of those sectors in a little detail and just pick some highlights. This is a, a plot of upstream investments by Chinese NOCs that I built up between 2000 and 2013. There are 50 countries there, almost $200 billion. This was all before BRI. It's thinned out and actually it's very difficult to follow where China has stepped away from projects. But that was at maximum extent. The bold colors are those where the investments were larger. So this was a huge scale of activity um, and much of the money has not been um, invested wisely. And this is a lovely graph that Erica Downs drew in 2017 that shows uh, the, what she identified as overseas uh, acquisitions and investments uh, and yet they crash as the BRI is rolled out. One, because the oil price fell. Two, because all the leaders of the companies were on their way to jail and everybody was frightened of doing anything. So I think those two things give you a feature that BRI has nothing to do with a huge chunk of Chinese overseas investment over the last 30 years, which was in oil and gas. So, um, Thermal and hydropower, Gavin has talked about thermal power. Yeah, it's one of the few remaining suppliers and finances of thermal power, particularly now the Japanese have stepped back, even Singaporean banks have stepped back. They're building some gas-fired power stations, uh, but their effort is mainly Africa and Southeast Asia and South Asia. Hydroelectric power, it is the world's largest dam builder. A history going back 60, gosh, 60 years of history of international dam building, um, again across developing countries, as Kevin has described. And there's a footnote at the bottom that in, in, in 2016, Chinese companies had contracted 30% of greenfield power, power plant projects in Africa during this five year period. 
um, and that includes hydro, coal, and gas. So, so yeah, they are big players in electricity now, as uh, Kevin has shown. Uh, one has to decide whether that is because of BRI or whether it would have happened anyway. Power grids, the state power grid company of China is very big. Uh, it is very ambitious. It has money to spend. And over the last two, 15 years, it's been buying grid companies or shares in grid companies in a number of countries. It is constructing grids uh, in developing countries. It also has this ultra high voltage transmission technology, which it's not only building at home, it is building in Brazil and probably other countries as well. Nuclear energy, you will know that China has the, the, the most ambitious uh, construction program, domestic construction program for nuclear power. And slowly, the Chinese companies are looking overseas. The Russians are much more active in securing real contracts. Uh, the Chinese are building in Pakistan, planning in Argentina, Romania, hoping in other countries, but they're moving much more cautiously, partly because uh, they're busy at home and the target uh, has just been ramped up. Uh, so they'll be building another 20 gigawatts uh, during the next five years back in China. So they've got plenty to do in China. When that slows down, they will move overseas. Renewable energy solar and wind um as uh kevin said they're not major investors but they've been exporting since 2004 uh because there were no the solar people because there were no incentives for domestic deployment of solar then we had the trade disputes after which they were allowed to sell more into the domestic market there was a new renewable energy law but they're starting to manufacture overseas yeah, partly because of the trade disputes and also um, buying technology companies to get access to technology and in a small way deploying overseas. A colleague of mine, Yao Li Xia, and I have been working on the Middle East recently and there the Chinese companies have been getting some sizable projects uh, starting to roll out in, in the Middle East. And the exports of equipment started to surge again from 2015. Wind is not so dominant, um, but again, Goldwind bought Vences for the technology. And in recent years, supply from the factories has exceeded domestic demand, and so exports have grown. Again, I don't see the BRI being a major player in these trends. Finally, technology mineral extraction. Um, you'll be aware that China is the home to most of the world's production of rare earth metals. Uh, this is not just because of the geology, it's because of the low costs of production. So it dominates the market, even though there are resources around the world. But what we're looking at here is the overseas. So we got uranium, lithium, cobalt and nickel. Examples of overseas mining activities by Chinese companies. Uh, and this, I think, ha definitely has the aim of bringing a lot, most or all, of these extractive uh, materials back to China. Um, and we'll see how that goes. So my conclusion is that there's a 25-plus year program of internationalization of Chinese energy companies, and in many forms, the internationalization is investment, it's services, uh, etc. And if you want to stretch it, it goes back 60 years. Mainly state owned enterprises, but not entirely, as, as Kevin said, in the renewable sector, it tends to be more private, but strong state support throughout. Uh, the main motivation, I haven't looked at host country motivations, which is really interesting, but I haven't looked at that. The main motivation to me is business development, whether it be investment in new projects, extraction, to sell equipment or to provide services, even EPC services. 
The main driver has been changes in the domestic market um, and companies, you know, these big companies, they got very intelligent bosses, they can see this stuff coming. So the oil companies moved in the 1990s, the power companies, I believe, would have already moved without BRI because they had to, if they were going to survive. Um, and, and so they were moving, BRI may have helped. Combined with technological development, and thus you, you, you've got uh, the whole renewable energy and, and, and uh, the technology minerals. So fossil fuels first, then electrical power. And my conclusion, though I'm prepared to be challenged on this, that if you look at the last 30 years, BRI has probably, in the energy sector, had only modest influence on corporate decisions and behaviours, with a few exceptions, for example, Pakistan or wherever. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, great presentation, Professor uh, Andrew Speed. Um, uh, I wanted to, I mean, I think Barry has a question. Um, Barry, would you like to read it aloud? Sure. Uh, you mentioned that internationalization uh, has had strong support historically in China. Uh, but I was wondering whether there was anything added in terms of state support by the BRI, or was the level of state support already so strong that there wasn't much more that the state could do uh, to encourage internationalization in terms of energy? I think probably Kevin would have the answer to that. But my guess, and I don't do the detailed research that Kevin does, that particularly for the power companies, let's, let's leave the fossil fuel companies out of it, uh, it was easier to, to get money, uh, to get loans for dams and, and power plants. Uh, so, as I say, it probably was easier to get money, but it wasn't difficult beforehand, I believe. But I, I, I invite Kevin, if you had hard evidence that, the, that uh, electricity companies uh, could definitely get either cheaper loans or get loans on more relaxed conditions. Uh, Kevin, do you have direct evidence for that? Yeah, uh, a little bit. Um, there's there's prior to, uh, the NDRC puts out sort of priority lists and uh, of different um, uh, of different sectors that they're trying to target, and uh, also priority lists of countries and sectors that they're trying to target. Um, and the policy banks are there to facilitate. You know, that's a, these are these two banks are policy banks, and their core thing is to facilitate that. But like you said, I agree. I agree with you on the commercial sector uh, companies. They are more commer commercially driven, um, and they don't necessarily need. Uh, many of them do get financing from China Development Bank or Export Import Bank, but they also use their retained earnings, um, and they can tap Chinese capital markets. And sometimes even some of them can use international capital markets. So they have a, a, a broader sort of set. Of uh, uh, of financing capabilities that that they can that they can tap. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to follow up on this question because from my own research, I, um, I was wondering if you have any insights on uh, patterns of ownership. For instance, you mentioned that uh, in solar power, there are companies uh, from China going to manufacture uh, outside. And from my experience in Southeast Asia, I noticed that these are mostly uh, private sector companies, uh, whereas state-owned companies, they engage more in construction contracts and uh, uh, mergers as well. Have you noticed this? Um, in your well, in a, very, in, a, in a very general way, uh, I don't do the detailed work that, that you do. But yes, this, this makes sense. And it, it's, it reflects the nature of the sector, the solar and wind sector is more private though, though, as I said in the very first section, I always get worried when people say a Chinese company is privately owned. Um, <laughs> you know, there's no state ownership anywhere locally behind it, but le let us pretend for the moment that these, these, com these actors are truly private, then, then yes, yes, you're right. I think it reflects the sector, whereas in oil and gas and thermal power, uh, private companies uh, the, are almost non-existent and grids, yeah. And there's also a question from Professor Booth. Uh, I don't know if he wants to read it aloud. Oh, um, thank you. 
And thank you to, prof to both Professor Gallagher and Professor Andrew Speed for great presentations. I'm uh, curious about the, um, the role of the state in uh, driving some of the investments. Um, I mean, the five-year plans, they include some uh, investments, uh, essentially requiring the companies to implement certain projects and emphasizing their strategic uh, benefits. But then we see in the literature and, and actually in your, in your fascinating uh, presentation that there is also a commercial rationale to most of these projects. So I'm curious, uh, are, uh, uh, basically, who is determining the investments? Is it, is it a company that essentially emphasizes the strategic benefits of some of their key projects and lobbies in order to have them included in the five-year plan and, and by doing so, uh, securing state support for the realization of these projects? Is it bottom-up or is it top-down, as we can see in other parts of the literature, where basically we see that the state is, is uh, portrayed as imposing investment decisions on SOEs and even sometimes on private uh, investors? So how do you see these, these dynamics, essentially? I, I will answer the, the oil and gas bit. I'll leave Kevin on electricity. Um, my erstwhile colleague at Dundee, Xuan Li Liao, wrote a good paper about six years ago uh, on the overseas investment, saying who is the principal and who is the agent. And, and this is a constant source of debate. And I think it's a mix of the two. But on the one hand, the companies, the oil companies just go where the oil is or where the opportunities are that they can get in. And, you know, I've been to places and, you know, the embassy says, we didn't know they were coming, you know, so uh, yeah, they, they just go and do it. But there are other places um, such as, you know, maybe Iran, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, maybe Saudi Arabia, Sudan, certainly, uh, Venezuela, where the government is deeply involved. So, so I think there's a, to me, in the oil and gas, it's mainly the companies and then say to the government, hey, we're here, you know, we need some support. But in some cases, it, it, it's, the, it's the government leading. And I think my one example that's really telling is Sudan. I remember talking to somebody who had been number two in Sudan for many years. And in 2014, 15, when the place was falling apart, I said, why don't you guys just get out? You know, you've made your money, get out. Uh, he said, the government wouldn't let us. We cannot be seen to be leaving Africa. So yeah, I think in my view, a minority are driven strongly by government for strategic reasons. The majority in the oil and gas are companies just going to where there are projects that they want to win. Kevin, I leave for you to do electricity. Well, I, I'd largely agree with that. Uh, and again, sort of uh, emphasize the point I made a second ago about the distinction between policy banks, where their goal is government policy driven objectives and finance and what I call commercial. Like you said, uh, there's not, not a heck of a lot of 100% private firms um, but they're commercial in orientation in the way that you said. They're looking to maximize profits uh, in, in an analogous way to, uh, to, to other firms. But they have a, if, they, if they're not state-owned, they were definitely at least incubated through all the robust uh, industrial policies throughout the different, uh, different municipalities and, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, so I'd, 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 I'd make that... I'd make that distinction and, and, and largely, largely, largely agree. Um, my, uh, with, with one exception on the politics part of it, um, I published an article in Development and Change in, I think, January of 2019 with a colleague, Gregory Chin, from New York University called Coordinated Credit Spaces. And uh, we divvied up a lot of the research. And he was uh, able to do a lot of um, interviews with CEOs of the, of the, of, uh, of the commercial firms um, about the BRI. I, I worked more on the development finance. That's more, that's more what, where my particular uh, research expertise is. And 
I think uh, what we say in the paper, we're not sort of revealing anything, anything secret here, is that um, they're, every, everyone in the commercial sector is very aware of the, of the BRI. And like you said, every firm is one or two or, or at most three steps away from the state. And so whenever they're in a country that has a BRI, BRI MOU, and they decide to go there for all the reasons that you mentioned, they definitely make a big deal out of it and they call it a BRI program. Um, uh, they make a, uh, but, and they're very comfortable in Singapore. They're very happy that a country like Singapore, that, uh, that, uh, there's lots of, uh, lots of investment and, and lots of returns to be made and, uh, to fly a big BRI flag. But, uh, but in, in say uh, Kazakhstan or in, in certain, you know, certain, certain, certain countries that have high risk profiles or high debt in, uh, in sustainability, many of those commercial firms are reluctant to go unless the policy bank creates this coordinated credit space that makes it a little bit more safer and less riskier for them to go. So if the, if the development bank is there with a big loan to the sovereign and the sovereign creates a special purpose vehicle that's guaranteed by the sovereign that the development bank is there and Sinosure also ensures that, that makes it a little bit easier for a Chinese firm to go and build and operate the power plant. And it makes it easier for the Bank of China to give that firm a loan. So that's a, an example of how, well, it's not, um, it, it's commercially motivated, but but the, but the drivers of commercialism are very different than in say a Western firm, right? Uh, because uh, uh, the, 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 those firms might not go to, to many countries uh, if that credit space wasn't created uh, because the market environment wouldn't be there. So that, that to me is, is the, of all the, of all the concerns and risks about the BRI, to me, that's the sort of big innovation of China in the 21st century. Uh, something that's sort of gotten forgotten about development finance uh, in the West, although it originated in, in Eastern Europe and in and, uh, um, and, and countries like Germany. To me, the, the KFW of Germany is, is perhaps one of the most uh, innovative banks, commercial or um, public in, in the whole world because it's done this on sort of green energy and climate change. It's saying, you know what, the private market is always behind, right? There's, they're too cautious. That's what they're in. They're short term and they're too cautious. Um, and the KFW um, has said, well, there's a whole bunch of sectors that China could, excuse me, Germany can have a comparative advantage in in 15 years, um, you know, um, but we're going to need to go out there and be the first mover. Um, the China Development Bank and Export Import Bank of China are doing that um, in order to help a lot of their firms gain global market share. Many of those firms wouldn't do the investments they did without that sort of blanket of protection before they went there. Sorry, quickie. I'm glad you mentioned Sinosure. Um, they're one of the reasons that the renewable energy projects are not happening. I met a law firm who you do due diligence, pre-project due diligence, uh, and used to report back to Sinosure, and Sinosure would, would say, well, this, this project is not bankable. So Sinosure is doing a job, and they're finding you know, renewable energy investments, say, in Southeast Asia, are very risky, and therefore they would not recommend support from the state policy banks. Yeah, and connected to this, just one minute, like there was another question from the audience, from Dr. Dasani, which asked, do the returns justify the decision to invest? I think ultimately this is the, the, the question. So while the banks take off the risk and uh, you know, somehow make the investments easier, like do, are these plants actually um, economically sustainable in, in your views? Well, I just, I'll stick to oil and gas. Um, that yeah, they win some and they lose some as, as all companies do, but they, they will have given, if oil prices stay low, they will have lost a lot. And the government will have lost even more through their uh, loans for oil to places like Venezuela. So yes, uh, if I put it in geological terms, a lot of money has been pissed down the drain in, uh, in oil and gas, though some have been profitable. Kevin, electricity. Well, one of the other uh, distinctions, especially on the development finance side, 
and I and I answered this to uh, one of the questions in the in the chat here, is that the China Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of, of China have what they call a portfolio of approach of finance, meaning they're going to get look at and do an assessment of a whole set of road and and power plant and city and citywide investments and and literally say okay in this particular area we're gonna we're gonna give a credit line of 10 billion dollars um for a for a for a huge family of projects okay and some of those will have immediate returns some of those will have 10 or 15 year returns and they're hoping that over time there's going to be spillovers across all of it that will even make the ones that are in the short term not so um, profitable relative uh, relative to the long term ones. That's a that's a very different sort of mode than the um, than say the World Bank where you're 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 proposing one particular project and you have to demonstrate that that one particular project has a rate of return uh, and that you're going to put tolls on the roads and, and 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 things like that. So it's a it's a different it's a different if it's it's a different approach. Um, and again, especially with the policy banks, they, as long as they are, they're not profit maximizing, they are non-performing loan minimizing, and they've done an incredible job on that, right? They, they hardly have any non-performing loans around the world, and they do make a profit, right? The China Development Bank is one of the biggest banks in the world, commercial or policy. Um, that said, I think um, since since you you mentioned oil and gas, we'll we'll let you stay there. But I, I think the big mistake for the China balance sheet is coal, because even in the countries that um, that China is financing for coal now, definitely certain environments: Pakistan, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malawi. In those countries, the price of coal is often cheaper than renewables right now. Um, and that's not the global average by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but uh, each of these coal plants has a 40 year, uh, 40 year lifetime. And even in say Indonesia, the studies that we've seen um, and other Southeast Asian countries where those are the areas where the prices are, are lowest, even with respect to um, taking away some of the distortions that are sort of policy driven like subsidies and so forth and it's only going to be eight or nine years before uh coal is uh is too expensive relative to the alternatives so these firm these these plants are going to be stranded assets they're going to be stranded assets for the china balance sheet they're going to be stranded assets for the host country it's um and without all the social costs that are just uh really damning for local communities and for the global climate. And I think this is an area that they, that they really have to focus on. And now sort of the whole world is watching because just in the past three months, uh, the, the, basically the, the, three, the, the, the three remaining international financiers of coal-fired power plants were the two uh, Japanese development finance institutions, which just announced about uh, two and a half weeks ago that they were going to stop doing that. And so the South Korean president uh, was, uh, the South Korean development banks are also, are, are also big uh, financiers of coal-fired power plants around the world. They announced that they were going to introduce legislation to stop it. That legislation uh, is moving its way through the parliament now and is supposedly going to be voted on in the next couple months. So after those two are off, we already have an OECD pledge that OECD countries aren't going to be doing this. We already have development banks across the world basically banning it around 2013. So the Chinese institutions are standing out there on, uh, alone. So in the short term, they're getting lots of projects. Their firms are building a lot of the things. The firms might not be so worried about. They're going to get paid earlier. But these big development banks are going to really have some, some bad assets um, on their balance sheets, as are the other side of the balance sheet. And the reputational risk that's growing on this um, and the social and environmental risk is a little bit of a ticking time bomb that I really think um, really warrants uh, some, some, some sort of you know, empirically driven due diligence 
um, because I think the costs of these stranded assets, reputational risks and environmental risks outweigh uh, some of the short-term benefits of uh, globalizing domestic adjustment and getting short-term projects for some domestic firms.